Okay, what a nice start for our event today. Dear Education and Cultural Attaché of the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia to Germany, Professor Dr. Ardi Marwan, dear Professor Dr. Dieter Mack, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. Good afternoon to everybody joining us today and welcome to the Zoom world of the Indonesian Embassy and the House of Indonesian Cultures in Berlin. We started our event with the jazz big band composition Sunda Jive by Dieter Mack, a different and groovy welcome for you all. Dear guests, welcome to our 118th Sarasehan meeting entitled Gamelan Music and the Search for Identity, a conversation with the German composer Dieter Mack. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure that our education and cultural attaché, Professor Ardi Marwan, is with us today and has agreed to say some words of welcome to us. So first of all, we kindly ask you, Pa Ardi, to open our event. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih, Bu Birgit. Um, dear Professor Dr. Dieter Mark, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, a very warm welcome from my side to everybody who has joined us to be part of our 118 Sarasehan, which we still keep online due to high COVID-19 rates here in Germany. We have the honor to have a guest with us today who has been engaging himself in and for music education in Indonesia for at least 40 years. In 1995, he published four volumes of his book, Sejarah Music or Music History which is used by music students until today, and already in its 12th edition. Isn't it amazing? Besides this, he wrote music books and a book about popular music for school kids, also still in use up to today, and a book about music education, and all of these books are written in Indonesian language, or Bahasa Indonesia, to be used by our school and university teachers. The standard works, introduce us to music history worldwide, including our own music, the traditional music of Indonesia. All these books are the results of his tireless work at the University of Teaching Education, or UPI, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia in Bandung, which started in early 1990s and still lasts until today. This year in September, for example, Professor Mark will teach composition for graduate students from UPI Bandung online. Professor Mark initiated a very fruitful cooperation program between the University of Music in Lubeck, where he held a chair, and uh, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia in Bandung, focusing on didactics of local music, early music education, and composition. When Professor Mark started to work in Indonesia, I think we were still very focused on Western music and ignored our own musical roots more or less completely when we speak of music education. I am very convinced that it is Professor Max and his local partners merit for a great part that our children now learn more about our own musical roots, are taught to appreciate the richness and beauty of our own traditions, which to me, being a teacher by myself, is important for developing a positive attitude and a kind of pride of uh, one's own culture, a pride that may not be confused with nationalism, but a pride that helps to build up self-esteem. At the same time, Professor Mack has founded his own Balinese gamelan group in Freiburg. I was in Freiburg many years ago, which is Angul Jaya and teaches Balinese gamelan music here in Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very obvious that Professor Mack is a person who has done and still does incredible work for the German-Indonesian relations in his field. And I would like to take this chance to express my deep gratitude to you, Professor Mack for all the efforts and dedication you have put in to deepen our knowledge of each other and also of our own cultures. I've learned that you are a person with so many talents or facets, a teacher, a composer, a writer, an expert of music history, and I'm very keen on getting to know you better today. I'm confident that our audience is as curious as me, and therefore I will finish my greeting now by wishing us an interesting and stimulating afternoon with you, Professor Mark. Thank you. Terima kasih, Bu Birgit. Terima kasih, Bapa. Thank you very much, Professor Ardi Marwan, Education and Cultural Attaché at the Indonesian Embassy in Berlin. 
Honored guests, now let us get into our topic and I would like to introduce to you our today's guest. He was born in Speyer, not far from the city of Mannheim in southwest Germany in 1954. From 1975 until 80, he studied composition, music theory and piano at the University of Music in Freiburg. Between 1977 and 81, he worked as assistant in the experimental studio for acoustic arts of the Heinrich Strobel Foundation, which uh, is part of the then called Südwestfunk today, Südwest Rundfunk Broadcasting Station. 1978 was the year when he first went to Bali in order to study Balinese gamelan music. The year 78 marked a change in his life, which from now on and until today has revolved around Indonesia, especially Bali and West Java. Besides countless activities related to Indonesia, there was the founding of a Balinese gamelan group in Freiburg in 1982, as we just heard, a tour through Southeast Asia with a German musical ensemble performing his own works, organized by the Goethe Institute in 1988, a long-time lectureship at the Pedagogical College IKIP in Bandung from 92 to 95, numerous workshops in Indonesia organized in cooperation with the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAAD mostly, and as we also just heard, a series of teaching books mainly to be used by Indonesian music teachers and students about music history, popular music, and music education, but also books about contemporary music in Indonesia for the German reader. Today, he is professor for music theory at the University of Music in Lübeck, just facing his retirement. Let us warmly welcome Professor Dr. Dieter Max. Selamat sore, Pat Dieter. Yeah, selamat sore. I just have to correct two things. First, <laughs> I'm professor for composition here and not for music theory. I was of course, sorry. in Freiburg, and uh, I also have no doctor title because in practical music mm. in Germany, you don't uh, can uh, uh, receive a doctoral title so far. That's, it's only in musicology, but not in practical music as a composer or pianist or so. We still don't have that. It's different in the American system and the Anglo-American system and in other countries. Uh, in Germany, you don't have. We call it concert exam, uh, concert exam, which is the third level, uh, which is kind similar similar to a doctoral title. But anyway, that's I don't care about that. Uh, I like my work. I liked my work, uh, at least the teaching, and now I'm retired. Tonight, I will receive my retiring certificate. So it's a very symbolic day for me today. <laughs> yeah, congratulations in advance and sorry for the doctor I gave to you without you having it, sorry. Um, dear guests, those of you who know Dieter Mack a little bit closer know him as a contentious person who loves the discourse. And the more provocative the questions, the harder the discussion, the greater his, is his joy. So we decided to divide this talk into three blocks with a few questions from my side. And after each block, we open up the floor for the questions from you, our audience. The three blocks are about Dieter Mack, the teacher, Dieter Mack, the expert for contemporary music in Indonesia, and Dieter Mack, the composer. When thinking of questions to Dieter, do not hesitate to provoke him as he will love it. <laughs> he told me before. Before our last discussion section about Dieter Mack, the composer, we will watch a 23 minutes lasting video together of his latest composition, The Time After Reset. And then we will finish this Sarah Sehan with an open discussion that may last until Dieter drops from his chair or until our Zoom account is needed by Mas Iwa, our Bahasa Indonesia teacher for his class, which will be around 10 to 6. Okay, Dieter, let us first um, of all go back into the year 1978, when you went to Bali for the first time. I would like to ask you to give us a clue out of which tradition you came when you went to Bali. As we learned before, you were a student of composition, music theory and piano. 
and you worked in the Heinrich Strobel Foundation, which is actually focusing on experimental, mainly electronical music. Before that, you were the keyboarder of a jazz rock band in your hometown. What was comp composing education in Freiburg like in the late 1970s? Who were the composers and philosophers that set norms? And which of those composers and norms shaped you as a student? That's a very interesting and uh, very encompassing question. Uh, apparently, if you have a, a jazz and rock background, as I had, okay, I, I also learned classical piano, uh, then uh, you, you were not so welcome in Freiburg, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, at that time, Freiburg was a very re renowned uh, music university, but it uh, was very focused on uh, the classical tradition in re regarding composition, especially the Second Vienna School, Schoenberg, Berg, Reben, and then serialism in the early 50s, Stockhausen and so on. This was the ideology, uh, which at that time was called the so-called critical composing, which was mainly uh, represented by one of the two teachers, which was Klaus Huber uh, from Switzerland, uh, not Nikolaus A. Huber, he was teaching in Essen. Klaus Huber was in Freiburg and he's a Swiss guy. And my second teacher then was Brian Fernihau, a British composer who is now in San Diego, if I recall correctly. And he was uh, the, the, the founder, in, in order to come us, of the so-called complexism, uh, very complex music. And uh, so very two quite different teachers, which I had, and we were very lucky at that time in Freiburg, we as students, that we have the possibility to work with so uh, very outstanding but very different personalities like Klaus Tuber and Brian Fernihau. And answering the questions, what I have, how they have formed me, I would say, in a way, they haven't formed me, and that's what I like. Yeah? They have mm -hmm. just surrounded me and have helped me to find my personal musical language. Klaus Huber was more in, in the way that he gave you some practical ex uh, how say, uh, experiments to do, while Brian Fernihau was speaking much more about aesthetics and the philosophy of a piece, and he let you do whatever you wanted uh, to compose. So it was more the kind of discourse which we had at the time, which has formed me. And uh, also with a lot of guests, we had Morten Feldman, we had Heinz Holliger, we had Stockhausen, we had Georgi Ligeti. So all the big guys of that time, they, they passed by for a week or for some days and uh, we could discuss with them. And this was really challenging. And uh, regarding the uh, studio from the Heinrich Strobel Stiftung, this was actually the reason I wanted to study in Freiburg, because from my uh, experimental rock music experience, I was very interested also in uh, electronics. You remember at that time, Pink Floyd was very famous, mm -hmm. or in Germany, Tangerine Dream and Popol Vuh. So I also had one of the first MOOC synthesizers in Germany, and I was experimenting in that way, and uh, I knew this studio was something I was interested in. So I said, I must study in Freiburg to have the possibility mm -hmm. to work in that studio. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, as a matter of fact, that happened. I became all, uh, quite uh, fast the assistant in that studio, which I was until 81, as I still mm -hmm. recall correctly. And that also helped me very much to finance my studies. <laughs> mm -hmm. What was the attitude of these teachers towards non-European music as an inspiration or a means for composing? Was that I even think, a topic? No, it wasn't a topic at all. Uh, despite the fact that the classes, both classes, had been quite international. Uh, at that time, there were a lot of Japanese uh, people uh, coming, studying in Germany later than the Koreans uh, and so on. So uh, it was. I think uh, it was in 77 when Brian Fernihau uh, looked at his class. There was a Swedish, an American, a Japanese, a German, a Norwegian. What else? 
I don't remember, maybe some other, some other nationalities. Mm -hmm. And uh, once upon a time, he said, why, uh, hey, it could be interesting that if everyone tells a little about his or her own musical culture in, in the country, that would be interesting maybe uh, for the for the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he looked around and all had been very quiet because, for example, his Japanese student had been educated in Western music. She didn't know mm -hmm. anything about uh, traditional Japanese music. So then he gave some uh, tasks to the, to the students and he said, hey, you could do something on Balinese gamelan. Uh, 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 why? Yeah, I have a friend in Basel, in Switzerland, the ordinary for musicology, Professor Dr. Hans Oesch, and he uh, is a specialist for Balinese music. I will call him and you can go there and he will help you. So mm -hmm. I went there, I was very friendly, and there was also his assistant, Danka Sharaman, who was not so friendly at that <laughs> time. There was only <laughs> like that. And uh, then they told me that they had made a big research in the early 70s from Basel. And, but it was mainly on the Eastern East Bali ritual seven tone music, which is something very special still today. And not really that what we know commonly as the gamelan music. It's a very special type of music. It's gamelan gambang, gamelan slunding. And they gave me recordings and uh, the draft of a forthcoming book. And I tried to give my paper in this uh, in, in, in our seminar with Brian Fernier. And I must admit, I didn't understand nothing. I did understand <laughs> nothing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I must tell you something else. I found this music, especially the gambang, quite boring. It didn't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. So this was the beginning. But in spite of that, you you wanted to go to Bali, right? Yeah, to, this, to... this was then then after. Uh, in a way, uh, this 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 work with this music has, and because of my quite weak position in Freiburg, because of my rock jazz background, mm. uh, I felt that this is a, how shall I put that? Uh, and it was like a virus in me, and I said, "Hey, you, this, there is something all the others don't have. I, why not I go there?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I decided then in 78, uh, then I tried to learn uh, Indonesia, Bahasa Indonesia, which was just, just forget it. And uh, I read many books which were available at that time, there were not many actually, but some. And then I went to Bali and uh, the first thing I experienced was that the Balinese speak Bali. Bali, uh, Balinese language and not Bahasa Indonesia, only few in the village where I finally uh, came to in Sabah. There were mo all people spoke Balinese, some, namely the, the men spoke uh, Bahasa Indonesia, and, uh, but almost n nobody spoke English. Mm. So my first activity had to be uh, has had to be to learn language, language, mm. language, 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 mm. and that's how it's. So, so the first time I was there about for two months, I didn't learn much about the music. It was okay. more about language and culture, and it was so new for me. I'm coming from a small uh, small town, and I was a very local person, and it was mm. the first time in my life that I was so far away. And for the younger people here now. There was no, there was no internet. There was no mm. mobile phone. Yeah, if I want to make a phone call to Germany, I had to go to the post office in town, and it could last three hours uh, to get a connection. Yeah, so mm. completely, and even to go to that main town was a problem because Saba at that time uh, there was only a footpath from the village to the main road to Blabatu. And if it rained for half an hour, you couldn't go. Everything was a big lake. Yeah. So these were completely different circumstances. And mm -hmm. for a uh, humble Westerner than like me, it was a very, very exciting, but also uh, frightening situation sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
In an article you wrote many years after your first encounter with Balinese gamelan music yeah. entitled A Life in Between Two Chairs, yeah. you describe very impressively how you, a young student of composition, collided with a completely different tradition of practicing and learning music in yeah. Bali. You were rooting in a completely academic world, which is based on the study of written sources and on the application of well-defined sets of rules. Mm -hmm. But now you were confronted with a pulsing and very organic musical tradition, mm -hmm. living through the people who practice the music. Yeah. You, wrote, you wrote later, you were not able anymore to separate music from communication. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this to us a little bit more detailed? How is making and learning music in Bali different from here, especially in relation to communication? Maybe you can make your answer audible by using some listening examples. How did you learn Balinese gamelan music? I mean, probably you did. didn't even understand all the... All the I learned language. it like the Balinese learn, yeah. uh, learn it with one difference, that the Balinese already are familiar with the language, with the grammatics. Yeah. I was it. Yeah? Yeah. So the first piece I learned was Panyan Brahma. So people who know Bali know also the piece, which is an opening dance. Uh, and I learned the, the kind of pocket kanding, which is normally played by the uh, Gangsa Ugal. And uh, then two weeks later, I heard uh, the group playing the piece and I didn't recognize it at all. Yeah? Because, because I heard something completely different uh, compared with that what I have learned and so mm. far I didn't know what the relationship was and it needed years to get uh, behind these secrets now I listen to three uh, uh, three beats of a piece and that normally if it's a standard piece I know what it is mm. but at that time this was completely different mm. and the way uh, of teaching is the teacher shows you and you just repeat and he shows you again and you repeat and he shows you again and you repeat. So that's the individual learning, but that rarely happens in Bali because normally they do the same thing like that in the group. Mm. Yeah? And it's from the very beginning, a collective uh, giving and taking uh, and the piece develops, which means that the composer in a way, at least at that time, uh, he more gave, just gives kind of impulse uh, for the group and then the group adds something. I, I remember a remark by Rahayo Supanga, the, uh, in, uh, it, it's fa the most famous central Javanese composer who died recently. He once said, maybe the name composer is not the right name mm. for me, the right term for me. I'm more someone who gives uh, an impulse, an input to the musicians and then we develop that together. Together. It's maybe it, it, it's very special for, 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 ja, for Japanese uh, compositions. In, in Bali, it's more or less the same. Also, the Balinese compositions are completely different, like the Javanese. Hmm. But it works in the same way, which also meant when I created my Gamelan group in Germany, uh, we started from the very beginning with the same technique no notation, just demonstrating, imitating, demonstrating, imitating. Uh, until even some people get frustrated and they <laughs> group or something that happened. But yeah. I, I, I really stick to that method and I think it was uh, the right one. And that's completely different in Germany mm. uh, or mostly in Western music where you get a score uh, and you uh, have to learn your part. And if you can play your part, then it's fine. And if you are in an ensemble or let's say in an orchestra, you have a conductor, you sit down, you play your part and follow the signs of the conductor. Mm. So this completely different responsibility as an individual. Mm. Uh, in Bali, you are an individual, for, but you are integrated into a collective. In Germany, uh, you are, I don't know, in, in Western music, it's you are an individual, but uh, the orchestra is also kind of collective, but a collective that doesn't work because of its interaction in between, mm. but because of there's someone standing in front and uh, he tells you how to do. It's, this is a very simplistic mm -hmm. explanation now, but just for people who are not so familiar with music, mm -hmm. they might have an idea uh, of how that works. Maybe we'll listen to two examples and then I can exemplify it a little more. 
The mm -hmm. first piece is a Goncapia composition from 1977 by Gede Asnawar called the Kakamuda. Here it's a recording by the Goncapia Pinda, which is the neighbor village of Ma where I live, neighbor village of Sabo. Yeah, sorry, we have to cut every music example. It's, it's certainly a little longer. Now, uh, before I comment that uh, an example from a very famous Western piece, also the beginning. Okay, I think most people know that piece was the beginning of the Rite of the Spring from Igor Stravinsky from 1913. And uh, I have chosen this piece because in this beginning section, this is the introduction, 
it's big orchestra normally, but the introduction uses almost the same amount of instruments like the Gamelan Orchestra. The Gamelan, in, in this case, for Sukakamuda, there were 27 players, and in the Stravinsky piece, it's also 27 players. Yeah? But uh, the Stravinsky piece was conducted, it was Pierre Boulez in this case, and uh, all this phrasing, this kind of rubato in, in this section, it, it just comes from the conductor. Yeah? So you have really to follow uh, him. It does not come out of the interaction between the musicians. If you would really try to, to make this uh, part of the piece without a conductor, you sh maybe you need 20 rehearsals or even more, then, then you may achieve a similar result. And, uh, but this is very untypical for our Western culture, which doesn't mean something positive or negative. I don't want to say the one, the one is better than the other. These are two different ways of learning music. And this is important to be aware of it. And uh, even I know also in Gamelan, in recent contemporary comp uh, compositions, notation is used. For example, later we will come to a piece of mine, which is played by Kai <laughs> Fatahila with Ivan Gunawan, and they play with notation. But they also try to, to get beyond the notation after a while. Uh, it's just uh, they, need, they need for the progress of learning the piece, they use it. So these are two different traditions, and I found it very challenging to, to have experience in both traditions. And that's one of the reasons why I started the Gamelan Orchestra in Germany, because I think that would be a good experience for music students if they learn a completely different way of learning music and practicing music. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that for some people, this was a very important experience I know also there were a lot of people who, for them, it was much more interesting from a technical point of view. Normally, if I had percussion students, they were more interested in the complex rhythms and that stuff. And when they knew that, then they left the, the ensemble. This is one of the main problems here in, in, in Germany. Maybe if you do something like that, especially at an, you know, a music department, that you have an ongoing exchange of uh, players. And mm. uh, to, to get it really to a high quality, you need players who are four or six years with you in the group, and then you can get a quite satisfying result. And that's actually what we, something that we started in the 80s, uh, because there was an orchestra in Munich with Andrzej Schwarzani, there was the Freiburg, my Freiburg group, and there was some activities in Basel. Mm. And finally, we decided that all the real big concerts we make as a joint venture with all with the best players from all three groups. And sometimes it was under the name of the Munich group. Sometimes it was under the name of the Freiburg group. Sometimes under the name of the Basel group. We didn't mm. care. That was great. We had a very good interaction uh, and helped each other to get uh, the best quality of, uh, of the music. Mm. So, so through all the years, you, you kept the Balinese or the Indone yeah the Balinese way of teaching and practicing gamelan music. You didn't uh, uh, develop your own, let's say, mixed teaching technique of no, hmm? oh, no not at all. Because okay. I'm convinced that is the only that is this is the only way to achieve this kind of preciseness and uh, collective feeling in mm. in, in, the, in the music. Mm. After your first encounter with Bali, your relationship yeah. with Indonesia started to develop. Uh, starting in 1980, you became a lecturer for Balinese music in Freiburg and Basel, as you just told. And you should visit Bali from now on for many times, once even a whole year from 81 to 82. Yeah. During this time, you became a real expert for gamelan uh, music from Bali, we can say. What was it exactly besides the, this communicative way of practicing music that fascinated you about Bali and its music and what made you, what made you come back again and again to study Balinese gamelan music in a deeper way? I think this is one of the secrets in, one, in, in the life of a, of a person, which is hard to explain. Mm. <laughs> uh, there must have been something like a... There was some, I was attracted by something, and I really mm. can't put that in words. Uh, regarding music, I have tried to explain it a little, this way of playing music. It's, the funny thing is, is when I performed Balinese Gamelan, 
and on stage, I was never nervous, never. Mm. Uh, but when I performed uh, piano uh, duets or, or whatever with piano, I was always nervous. Mm. You know? And that made me thinking what that the way of learning, the way of getting into the music is something different. And uh, it's more, <laughs> yeah, it's a little it's exaggerating. It's, it's more human, maybe. Mm. You know? And that's why I think uh, it's an experience which I still don't want to miss. I only had the same experience when I started to play a lot of uh, minimal music pieces by Steve Reich. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we also had the, these pieces, they look so simple, and uh, they aren't. Yeah? And I mm -hmm. remember uh, that Steve Reich, in his first years, he, he didn't allow that his pieces are played by other people except his own group. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when we started to play some of his pieces at the first moment, you, you, you thought, oh, yeah, pff, no problem. You can side reading, you can get it. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We needed hours to get into this right mood of the, uh, of the music. So minimal music, I don't want to compare with Balinese music. They, they, it has nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the way of playing, the way of interaction, the way of, intercommunication between the players there is a lot of there are a lot of similarities mm. and i felt them again when i played like the music for 18 musicians for example when we played that we practiced over one semester that and at the end after six months in the performance it was just f incredibly fun to do to, to play together because we were really throwing the balls from one to the other it was was fascinating mm. and that's but you see, we, we, we practiced at the university over six months. This is completely irrelevant in the professional music business. Mm. Yeah? If I have a new orchestra piece, quite a complex one, and I uh, get that performed by a good orchestra, I get three rehearsals with three hours. Right? Mm. And I must be already really happy when I get that. Yeah? Mm. Uh, so no, that's, that's how, how it works. Mm. Yeah. I would like to come back to the teaching aspect for a moment. Yeah. As we can read in an article you wrote in a book called Nelken Duft in Wolkenkratzern, for you, a separation from a creative person and being a teacher is impossible. Yeah. Can you explain this to us? And how does the creative Dieter Mack affect Dieter Mack, the teacher? I think... Uh... If you, uh, for me, composing and making music is something I want to communicate to people. Yeah? And, and, and I need the feedback. That's very really important for me. Even if it's a negative feedback, okay, but not everyone has the same taste. But uh, music is for me a medium, uh, an abstract medium to communicate with, with, uh, on a level that I can't achieve with words. And uh, this kind of communication you, for me was always connected with a kind of curiosity. And to be curious uh, is for me one of the necessary prerequisites to become a teacher. Because if you are curious, you want to know what your student does. Yeah? And I always say, I learn probably sometimes more from my students than, them, uh, than they learned from me. Yeah? So my, the, the problem of a student was a real challenge for me and uh, I found it fascinating. And uh, this kind of communication between student and uh, teacher was for me very essential. How far that has influenced my music, I can't say, I don't know. But for me, it was a necessary uh, part beside uh, the uh, artistic work as a composer. And uh, this is one of the reasons also why the, the last year was not very easy for me. Teaching online uh, composition is something else uh, compared with sitting just in front of your student and you really get into the business and uh, with very, sometimes very personal arguments also. Mm -hmm. I remember situations where students uh, fell into tears. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, yeah. You, as a teacher, you are not only a technical teacher, but you are also kind of how do I put that? Father figure, or 
kind of partner for a mo at least temporarily yeah mm. and uh, this kind of, of of work was very essential for me mm. and uh, but how it influenced my music i can't say mm. Apart from being a teacher in Germany, you can also look back on many years of being a teacher in Indonesia. Is it is it is there a difference between teaching in Indonesia and teaching in Germany? Yes, at least it was. Okay. <laughs> when I when I started to teach in UPI, uh, at that time still Ikip, uh, the students were all sitting in front of me. That there are now two here in in in, in this Yudi and Leli. Hi. And you can ask them, they were my first students. They were my, in German, we say, Versuchskaninchen. <laughs> now we translate that. Kalinci percobaan. Huh? Kalinci percobaan in Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the first, uh, there was, you know, you knew this normally between teacher and student is a kind of hierarchy in Indonesia. And I, from the very beginning, I behaved completely different. Yeah. I, uh, I really destroyed this kind of hierarchy as much as I could, but that needed a long, long time. And I would say from that three years uh, I was teaching there in, in one row, uh, I needed one year to, to, to get that, uh, this kind of hierarchy away. You know? And uh, this is a basic difference, I think. Yeah? And, uh, this is also something which I tried to convince my colleagues uh, who were teachers that uh, hierarchy is fine. Sometimes you need to be authoritarian, but basically if you, uh, if you are more on the same eye level, you understand much more what the students have understood and what they have not understood. If it's only hierarchical, you will never get a response uh, except except in an exam but i hate exams so this was not re not relevant for me you know? and i remember one interesting th one interesting story they will still remember you mean I, I taught a course on balinese gamelan and i don't do i didn't use notation and we just listen and make an oral analysis uh, of the piece until we were until the end of the semester we were through the whole piece and had learned all principles uh, uh, of Balinese Gamelan with that piece and they knew they could really sing every voice. You know? And then came the exam. And then I took another piece of the same style and they should analyze it in the same way. 80% failed. And then I was called to the dean because that's impossible that 80% fail. And he asked me, what's going on here? And then we discussed that with the students. And it was the fact that they even recorded me what I said about this first piece. But the idea to apply this knowledge to another piece was completely uh, unusual for them. And then we, we discussed that and we tried it with some examples. Then we repeated the exam and everything was fine. Yeah? So this was a very, that was one very important step, I remember, uh, to understand that learning means to, uh, to, to develop the tools to, uh, in order to apply these tools to something else. This is learning mm. and not repeating just what someone has said. So this is um, more or less 30 years ago. Do you think it has changed until now? Partly it has, yes. Mm. Partly it has. But I, uh, I still, when, I, when I'm in Indonesia and then sometimes when I feel that the students are much more open and, and more direct now than they had been at that time. And, uh, but sometimes if I then pass by other classes, I still see this, see this very hierarchical uh, way of teaching mm. uh, and uh, yeah it's okay it's it's also an element of indonesian culture mm. so uh, <laughs> you, you can't just you, you can't just throw that away mm. yeah but uh, you can only give an alternative yeah? mm. and i i prefer to give this alternative as dita mack and not as a german or a westerner <laughs> just as me as the person yeah mm -hmm. So it's much more important what you live as a person 
in front of your students. Mm. That's my conv that I'm convinced about that. You know, mm. Maybe some people have other opinions about it. <laughs> mm. After your Goethe Institute tour through Southeast Asia, yeah. you we are repeatedly invited to hold workshops in Surabaya, mm -hmm. Jogjakarta, and mainly in Bandung. In Bandung, you worked uh, also as a long-term lecturer at the University for Teacher Education. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I just that's was what talking we're talking about. That's yeah. what we were talking about. That was from 1992 to 1995. Right. Your task while you were sent to Bandung was to build up a music department for graduate no, students, no, no, no. right? No, 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 no. There okay. Was a music department. There was a music department, but uh, it was completely uh, Western orientated, or what they thought is uh, Western music is. Mm. And uh, I found that so unbelievable and uh, impossible that the culture, which is so rich, like the Indonesian one, Uh, does neglect its, its own musical traditions in school music edu education. So and what did you do? Yeah, the problem was that uh, I, gave, uh, I gave a lecture there in 91, which caused a lot of uproar because I really strongly criticized this ideology. Mm. And uh, then the dean came uh, to me uh, laughing and said, hey, You are you are a funny guy, and next <laughs> we plan uh, re reform uh, reform uh, of our curriculum. Would you like to join and bring in your ideas? And I said, why not? Yeah, and uh, then I tried to get this long term lectureship via the German Academic Exchange Service, and uh, then I came the year ninety two, and then we started to make this reform, but this reform. Uh, in fact, was kind of mbonka skalanya, yeah? which means to turn everything upside down. <laughs> yeah? And uh, with the consequence that uh, I tried to, 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 to bring the, the Indonesian culture uh, more, more into the foreground, but, and, but at the same time, I also tried, I didn't want to, to throw the whole Western stuff away. Why? It's also not necessary. But to put it in a in a in a better format, and also in a, in a better kind of perception, I work very much more with music examples and less with theory, yeah? because any theory is nothing. Uh, theory is only relevant if you have an oral experience. Then you can draw a theory from it, but it's not not the other way around. And uh, that's important for me. Yeah. So you you turned the whole thing upside down, as you say, and um, you initiated a reform in Bandung. Yeah. Did the Bandung model affect other teaching institutions throughout oh, Indonesia? Oh, yes, in the way <laughs> that they all want to kill me at that time. <laughs> <laughs> national meetings. Uh, but I had one lucky uh, situation was that I, there was in December 92, I was just in the beginning, there was an article by an Indonesian musicologist, I don't want to mention the name now, and he wrote an article on the Sunday uh, edition of Compass, uh, the national newspaper, and he wrote that uh, Indonesian music is only shamanistic and very poor and only improvisational. And for the future generation, we should only focus on Western music and the local music only for tourists. And I was so furious when I read that article that I wrote a reader's letter, which was unfortunately as long as this article. But uh, Compass was very friendly. They put it on the same spot the next Sunday, uh, my uh, vote, for low Indonesian music instead of Western music. And that brought it to, to the attention of the uh, educational ministry. And then they asked me to join the national curriculum committee. And then it became funny when I started to change all of the school curriculum with these people who were, who also wanted to kill me at that time. But it was, well, it, it was interesting, it was interesting. I don't want to go into details now. At least we achieved something. Maybe speaking of your curiosity is um, a good point to open up the floor 
uh, to our audience um, before we finish this first uh, teaching uh, section. Um, let us ask our audience if there are already questions concerning teaching and your early years in Indonesia. Please, dear guests, feel free to unmute your microphone or put your question to our guest into the chat. I can also read it. Any questions so far from the audience? I do have a question. Please go on. Yeah. Um, Dieter, you talked about how, uh, about your approaches, how to teach Balinese gamelan. Mm. You also said that um, in the like in the normal music circus, I want to call it, um, it's impossible to teach music like this here in Europe. Mm -hmm. But let's say you would have the money and you would have the players. Would you be interesting in teaching one of your mixed chamber um, works? with this approach that you would take uh, for Balinese gamelan? 100%, 100%. That's also why I tried from the very beginning to, 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 to create my own groups, to play my chamber music, to, to, to find possibilities to do it in that way. Yeah? But uh, if I would have the money and the time, I would do it because I still be, I'd completely believe in it and uh, but you, you know for yourself, because you have played in orchestras very often, that is kind of utopia. Huh? Well, let's mm -hmm. chase that dream. I really like <laughs> this idea. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? <clears throat> oh. Please feel free to directly unmute your microphone. Um, I have a question. <laughs> OK. Hello. <laughs> uh, I would last, uh, like to ask, you were talking about uh, your con um, conviction that the only way to teach Balinese music also in the West would be the Balinese way, by immersion rather than notation and stuff. And I was wondering, how do you feel about the, let's say, the crutch we're using in some of the Western ensembles now to, for example, notate a number notation for the Chalong as a sort of a helping uh, notation, especially in concert contexts, because <clears throat> I mean, from my experience in our ensembles, we can barely do without that, especially for older players who find it really hard to remember the lines, especially for the bass instruments. Um, do you have a recommendation there? Or yeah, uh, I know that problem. I know the problem. Uh, I would uh, I would insist on, on not using notation. Okay. And uh, what I always did with the bass instrument players in, in, in my time when I was still teaching gamelan, that I asked them to learn the melody of the ugal, yeah? mm -hmm. that they really have the, the whole piece. And if you learn, if they are present when the others learn their parts, then they know much better how the, where to put in their notes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And they know how their notes are part of the whole uh, sound texture that exists. But mm -hmm. if they just come in and don't know anything about what the others start, do, then it's a problem. I agree. Yeah. So uh, you might compromise for a temporarily maybe, but I think it, it must always be the target, the the aim that even the base of the base of the Dagogan players, for example, that they can feel which note has to be played when if they follow. The, the whole melody, the, the pocket can be <coughs> played by the Ugal. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank I you. believe in that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, uh, I'm going to try to... Uh, it needs time. and pass it on. <laughs> it needs time and we have to be patient as the teachers, Carla. Yeah? That's true. We just yeah. have to be patient. <laughs> yeah? Carla, may I ask which Gamelan Orchestra you are speaking for? Um, I'm speaking for Freiburg and Basel. So ah, I'm okay playing in the Freiburg group and teaching in the Basel group. Um, but the groups are very, very small now. Um, so since Dieter has left Freiburg, it's been, <laughs> let's not say deteriorating, but it's been getting a bit difficult <laughs> to get enough players. I'm coming back on the 1st of May. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good news. <laughs> we are in need of a competent Pandang player. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Okay, there is uh, Maruno. Maruno. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I wondered, we had here in Berlin a gamelan group yep. led by a Balinese uh, who's unfortunately no longer among us. 
uh, his name was Gutama Sugio. Are you, uh, do you know him? Oh, sure. He was a very close friend of mine. Oh, he, good so. He's not Balinese, he's Japanese. Uh, I think he comes from Bali, actually. No, no, no. no? no. Oh, I see. Sorry. <laughs> well, he, he, uh, he, was it? he composed a lot of uh, music. Yeah. Yeah, and, and played. His, uh, I know his wife is still among us. Uh, his... And Hoffman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's she's and Sugio. No? Wow, that's Sugio. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 fine. You know him, so I, I, that was my question only. I wanted to know whether you knew him. Yeah, yeah, I know him very well, and I knew him very well because you know he died recently. Yes, yes. And uh, my friend Max Riefer, who just talked with me uh, two two persons before, he has just uh, played. Uh, a piece of him which has been uh, found in his uh, release mm -hmm. and uh, I'm very happy that we now try to perform as many pieces of him that have been forgotten or lost oh, or not played so nice far and uh, Max is very active in this direction I'm very thankful for that I will I will put the YouTube link in the chat for anyone who's interested thank you okay thank you do we have any more questions from the audience to Dieter Mack, the teacher. Okay, then I would say let us move on to our second topic, contemporary music in Indonesia. Dieter, in 1988, you went, as I said before, on a tour through Southeast Asia, invited by the Goethe Institute. You were accompanied by an ensemble of six musicians mm -hmm. performing your own music. On this tour, you met important Indonesian composers of that time, like Dodi Sakya Eka Gustiman, Hari Rösli, or Slamet Ashukur, to name, name only three out of many. Up to now, I guess you probably know all the important Indonesian composers of today. You have close relationships to all kinds of artists, and you are a profound connoisseur of the Indonesian intellectual scene. If you look at contemporary composing in Indonesia, could you share with us the different schools or trends that currently form the composer scene in Indonesia? How differently do composers in Indonesia use their own local traditions and how do they deal with Western music? Maybe you have some examples. Oh, this is really, we could, we could sit- Lecture of its own. Yes, we could sit until tomorrow. Uh, let's say like that, uh, what was once, there, there are basically two big groups and I, I must say it so roughly because uh, it, it's much more differentiated in fact. You have composers who work more or less in a Western contemporary tradition uh, and uh, you have composers who work exclusively from their respective local traditions. So in Bali, for example, because they have a long tradition of composing new pieces, uh, they are more related to their Balinese traditions and less to uh, Western one. Uh, while same in Java and also same in West Java, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to, sometimes you have uh, composers who have been were in, in a way sitting between the two chairs again yeah also in indonesia so that's why that's why it's very really different difficult to make this kind of, of, of schools for example or to say this is uh, style a and this is style b and so on and so on um, there we can listen to some examples for example, which uh, the, the sequence has nothing to say now. Uh, it, it's just various examples. For example, also the, the, this kind of mixture of popular uh, musical elements uh, with uh, gamelan related elements. And as I was a very close friend to the late Harry Rösli, I would like to begin with one of my favorite pieces of him. Only part it lasts, it's too long as eight minutes. We just will listen to two minutes, maybe. It's called Orang Basah. Oh, <laughs> 
Yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces from the from 1990, I think, uh, which he played with uh, a vocal group, which has three children, by the way, and uh, which he took home and gave them food and a bed, and then they had to, to work with him. And I think it's, it's uh, unbelievable what results had been uh, achieved. I think it's the, the, the type of the this flute-like voice, it's very... Uh, it re reminds me to su uh, Sundanese music and also the kind of vocal action sometimes, which you have very often with, with uh, kandang players. There's later even an anklung part in it. And uh, so he has a very unique way of putting, put it, putting Sundanese music into this kind of uh, pop music context. Uh, okay, uh, next piece. Uh, is by my close friend Ivan Gunawan, uh, <clears throat> who is the leader of Tiai Fatahila, and uh, we have a very close relationship. He is also the player of the piece uh, with his group uh, the time after we set, which we will listen to later. And he's also here, by the way. Yeah, I know he's here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, one piece which I like very much, uh, which we it is a recording of uh, the Gamelan Festival in Berlin in 2005, and uh, uh, it's called Kulu Kulu 2004. Okay, I hope Ivan apologizes that I cut his piece, even if it's not much longer, but uh, I would like to present some other pieces. Uh, so this is a very, for me, exciting development of Sundanese music, uh, which he has done here for Gamelan. And uh, another composer who does a very exciting development, especially with different scales, is Devakatut Alit from Bali. And uh, I would like to play a uh, part of his fascinating composition, Gurgel.
yeah, it's a pity to go out of this piece as well. Uh, but it's really fascinating composition, uh, like all pieces of Deba Katut Alit. I can really recommend everyone to, to listen to his music. He's, for me, the most interesting composer in Bali at the moment, and a very nice person. And uh, <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to, to talk with him about music. Okay, so these were two examples now, especially coming out from uh, local cultural backgrounds. Uh, the, the last example that I will present is from a composer who is more coming from a Western music background. And he's one of the youngest, but and I like him very much. And uh, he's also here uh, in our session. It's Setian uh, Tvichachyu. And I want to play a piece. It's a piano quintet called Burnt Cloves. Okay, also sorry to Setian that I had to get out. So we are in a completely different world now in a Western sound world. And uh, that's, he, that's his world. And I think it's very interesting and fascinating. And for me with some others, uh, a very interesting group of young composers who are very engaged. He's also making a lot of sessions like that, organizing things and uh, 
I hope he will develop uh, in that way as he has started. I think you see, for me, he will have a very uh, prosperous future, maybe. Okay. These are four examples of completely different approaches, uh, also different generations. And uh, so Harry Rösli would be the, the, the older generation, Iwan and Deva, the middle generation, Setia and the young generation. And, but we could continue now with a thousand other pieces. So please understand that uh, this is not possible in this context. But if you want something, you can always contact me via email and uh, I will send you a copy of, the, uh, of something if I have it, yes. Okay, back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, very interesting. I would say we can uh, open the floor for, for questions. I already saw the chat is very lively or has been very lively so far. Um, but before uh, we open uh, the floor, yes. Yeah, I, there was one thing in the chat when I think Aris asked uh, about, uh, he's coming in again. Aris was asking about uh, whether uh, using notation would be okay in Japanese music. And this Japanese music has a is completely different in tempo. There to, to write down the pocket notes, I think it's a possibility for practitioners, but in Balinese music, which is so extremely fast, you you had you would have to take to turn around the page all every two seconds almost, so this is not possible. Yeah, uh, even uh, just the speed of Balinese music uh, impedes the use of notation. That, according to my opinion, and the other reasons which we spoke with Carla before. Just everyone wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, be, before we go or invite everybody for the discussion, I would like to recommend a book uh, by you, Dieter. Zeitgenössische Musik in Indonesian, written by Dieter Mack. At least for our guests who understand the German language, it gives a very detailed overview and a deep insight into the contemporary music scene in Indonesia, at least until 2004, when the book was published. The book is actually not available anymore, but it may be borrowed from our library here in Berlin. And now I cordially invite everybody to ask your questions to Dieter Mack, the expert for contemporary music in Indonesia as we will have a separate section talking about Dita as a composer later, please try not to ask questions concerning the compositional style of Dita. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are your questions, dear audience? Please feel free to unmute uh, your microphone and um, switch on your screen and talk directly or give us a sign that you would like to talk. No questions about contemporary music in Indonesia? Can you see since you, since you started to work as a teacher in, in the early 90s in Indonesia, can you see that there is a, a red line of development in, in composing in contemporary music in Indonesia? Or, or you, ca you cannot say that probably. Difficult. I think uh, to, 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 to find these line, developmental lines, you need more time, more distance to it. Mm. I see a very high degree of activities in a thousand directions, and this is fantastic, and, uh, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to speak about uh, these uh, various lines. Mm. There is a question on, in, in the chat, uh, yeah. I will answer that by Svan uh, Langut. Can you recommend a CD compilation on contemporary music in Indonesia? No, I can't. Uh, sometimes you get a CD there, sometimes you get a CD there. Uh, certainly I have, I have collected as much as I could when I stay in uh, Indonesia. And my friends like Setian, they always send me new productions. So I have a good uh, collection. The Balinese piece, which I played before from Debak uh, Alit, this is on a CD published by Wayne Vitale, and uh, we could perhaps later uh, I could send more details to, to Birgit 
and uh, she could then distribute them to the uh, participants of this uh, Sarasehan. Um, and then Septian just sent you uh, a link where you find uh, compositions of young uh, Indonesian composers, including also electronic and electroacoustic music, which is uh, a very active scene in Indonesia, as far as I know. And uh, Septian is one of the also most important composers in this direction, but also others. And I think uh, via this link, you also can find music of uh, that direction. Okay, uh, Svan, I hope I could uh, answer at least partly. Uh, uh, Yes, you can also contact us after the event and ask for any links and information about the pieces um, uh, you could hear and um, we will send you all the information we can get that you ask you're asking for. Any more questions to Dita? Then I would like to come to our last part and speak with you about you being a composer and the Balinese influence in your work. <laughs> now we get into the topic. You like to cite the German composer Helmut Lachenmann, who once said that when you are dealing with other cultures, a true creative act can only emerge out of a radical penetrating into another culture instead out of a touristic walking around. Mm -hmm. You also once wrote elsewhere that uh, it took you four years to understand Balinese music and another 10 years to realize how the Balinese people themselves understand their own music. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess we all agree that your dealing with Balinese music resembles a radical penetration rather than a touristic walking around. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference between what Lachenmann pictured as a touristic walking around and a radical penetration? Maybe by comparing some examples from other Western composers who were influenced by Balinese or Indonesian music in different ways. Yeah, the, the, the question is uh, what is influence and what is just a quote or a pastiche? Yeah. Uh, for example, when we take the Prince of the Pagodas from Benjamin Britten, this is just a quote uh, with a certain function. This is no influence from Balinese music. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we could just listen to this section. It's uh, Prince of the Pagodas is a very famous opera by Benjamin Britten. And uh, he quotes uh, a part of Balinese gamelan music, including gambangan. I think he must have the music, the transcriptions from Colin McPhee, who was a close friend of him. And Colin McPhee uh, already had a close connection to Wayan uh, Lothring, one of the most famous composers in the 30s. Maybe we can listen to that section just for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. 
okay, I think this is very obvious, uh, very obvious quote. Uh, another case is when the composer really, so this, uh, that might be the touristic uh, attitude uh, Britain was in Bali, but he really he, he never got into the uh, gamelan music. It's another case, for example, with Lou Harrison, uh, but with Javanese music, and uh, he was really very much influenced by Javanese music. And, uh, at, and he has also made the right decisions when, for example, he wanted to combine Western instruments and gamelan instruments in a always present at that moment the, his piano concerto where the piano is retuned in the, to the tuning uh, of the gamelan and uh, let's hear an example from Lou Harrison's piano concerto. This is a very interesting solution, but I will also show you a solution which for me doesn't work and which is really almost disgusting, but and, and that I feel very ashamed because this is a German person who has done that. I don't want to mention the name, but the piece is called Solitude. I think I did not explain that. 
uh, it's clear by itself. Uh, this is something which I don't like, and uh, I hope it will not happen anymore, or something like that. Okay, let's uh, now uh, to to the, your first question, and the the the, the, the total the radical way which uh, Helmut Lachenmann is asking for is just that you really live in another culture uh, for a longer time and uh, you also you also join the the, the, the daily activities now, i was working as uh, when the temple during a temple ritual i was working as a cook uh, together with the balinese etc etc so i just try to behave like a normal village uh, member and uh, so as long as i can so and besides learning the language and talking with the people in the language and all that stuff so but the, the the result for me was much more that i feel the balinese world is my one world and my western world and my western music is is the other world so i never never tried to combine these two worlds I, I, I even did it more in the other way i tried to separate them because they were from they are so different for me that it did never appeal for me to bring something together which has nothing to do with each other so that's just about the problem of influence from the gamelan uh, this is that this problem composers are influenced by and then uh, you get you, people read that in your biography in a concert and then they found gong sounds and pieces where there aren't uh, any gongs this is something that yeah is it that people need orientation in contemporary music maybe maybe that the the critics and the musicologists they, they they look for orientation and when they find something like that it's kind of orientation that may be one uh, maybe one reason but for me as a composer that was never from relevant uh, at all for me it's just when i compose uh, there are thousands of influences or in other words everything that i hear or that is maybe kind of influence for myself even a car that is going by or the sound of a, uh, of a railway uh, at a railway station or something like that these are always sounds and as a composer you you just react to sounds and you 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 test them uh, unconsciously uh, regarding their musical relevance and then when you start to compose you try to forget everything and start from scratch uh, which nobody can do, but it, it's utopian, I know, but at least you should try. And that's also what Lachenmann means, that composing is to build your own instrument and not to imitate another one. Yeah? And uh, this is, uh, that's why I always say, whether I'm influenced from Gamla, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah? Uh, other people can write what they want. Uh, certainly I use sometimes techniques which you find also in gamelan music for example this kind of marking the formal structure with gongs but you find that also in other pieces which have nothing to do with gamelan this kind of marking formal marking so for me in music there are what I call transcultural elements and intracultural elements and these intracultural elements they belong very closely to the music language we are talking about and so if you would hear that you would already have the connotation ah bali yeah for example or ah java or ah, whatever you know? uh, so this i, I don't touch that ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, but the other these transcultural things uh, this i think there is some some interesting aspects in it but if i see it from that point of view sometimes i feel similarities between mozart and gamelan in regard of the timing and balance of uh, and uh, of formal structures and uh, i feel the same in my music and uh, found fibonacci series and gamelan music i use them in my music stockhausen used them so what is influence and what is let, let's say transcultural musical material and techniques 
which in one culture are more prominent than in another. But that, 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 there must not be any kind of influence between each other. It just happens. Yeah, actually, you already answered my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would like to recommend your latest CD anyway, because uh, now we are getting really into the music of Dieter Mack. This is a triple CD that has recently been published by the University of Music in Lübeck, summarizing your compositional work. It has the wonderful poetic title, Klingende Fäden und Sprechende Rhythmen, Sounding Threads and Speaking Rhythms, The Musical World of Dieter Mack. A CD I can really rec recommend to anybody who likes to get to know the composer Dieter Mack. This CD shows three focuses, chamber music, music for organ, and orchestra music. There are no pieces for gamelan instruments, as, as some might expect. And when we listen to the music on the CD, as you, as you just told us, actually, we do not hear any gamelan sounds nor any strange scales reminding us of gamelan music. And I would like to read one sentence, the musicologist Christoph Flamm described uh, your work in the booklet to this uh, CD. He writes as follows. He avoids any quotes, mounting, collages, any kind of antagonistic clashing or makeshift jobs that, at the very latest since neoclassicism, turned the heterogeneity inside out, celebrated the stylistic clash and the superimposing of unsuitable material or deconstruction. And I think now is the time, Dieter, that I, I, actually I wanted to ask you to explain this to us, what he meant, but I think you already did. But now we need to listen to examples of your music, <laughs> well, of well, course. Shall, well, shall I explain what he wrote? Yeah? <laughs> of course. Why he wrote that. Yeah? You should explain what you think what he meant by no, writing I that. <laughs> should no. I explain what he meant? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Who was that? <laughs> that was just a joke. I'm working at the music school of Lübeck. So, um. <laughs> okay, but no, I think you just uh, explained everything in a very um, in a very detailed way. But um, I am sure our audience now wants to listen. How is all this background set into music? How does the music of Dieter Mack? Uh, sound and now you have to give us some examples of your music Dieter. Yeah, that's now a little problem uh, because uh, if we still have time because I would like to present one example and uh, it, it lasts the piece I have always long pieces and this piece lasts <laughs> uh, 22 minutes and I would like to play the first 11 minutes. Uh, that there is special reason that there is a very good point to stop it. Yeah? And, and, uh, and maybe we drop the, the, the second piece then that, that uh, when we want to listen to the gamelan piece and uh, postpone that only to the video, because I would really like to play this piece uh, in, ex, uh, in its length, because it's very rep representative for my work the, over the last yeah, 20 years, I would say. It's, and it's also one of the best performances I ever had. Mm -hmm. It's a live performance of the premiere. It's called Camel Music 5, Chamber Music 5, for 30 musicians and uh, played by the Cologne based ensemble Musikfabrik. And the conductor is Enno Popper, also a composer. And they did such a fantastic work. And uh, they achieved that exactly what I meant this kind of interaction in the group where the conductor only organizes in this case. But this group is so close together since uh, years that they really can play in a way which I uh, think is the best interpretation I ever had on of a very complex piece like that. So let's listen to the first 11 minutes of Kammer Musik 5. Uh, and please, it's a piece with very soft sounds and very loud sounds. The, please be aware of that, that the, the, I remember a friend of mine has listened to the piece, so it's a great piece, only this two minutes break in the middle, why did you do that? It was no break, but there was a very smooth harp and just drums in the background and he didn't hear that in his car. Yeah? So please be aware of such problems now in that piece. <laughs>
just the first half of the piece about uh Mastita, can, can i ask any question yeah please okay uh thank you uh i would like to ask uh, regarding your last explanation about the trans culture and intra culture yeah. uh yeah does it mean that uh, uh it would not happen any fusion between uh, those two cultures uh, in this case east and west if it is so my second question what is the manifestation of uh, the influence of its culture? Yeah, that, that's my question. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, first thing is I, I don't believe in any kind of fusion. Uh, that's, I'm not interested in that. And, and others may try to do that. Uh, I don't do it. And uh, I think the, here for me, uh, this piece has also nothing to do with fusion. It's just my music. And uh, if, Someone would ask me where uh, my gamelan influence uh, is here in the piece. I could only say maybe the, the, this type of metallic sounds, which I'm interested. But I think that uh, to, to call that an influence from gamelan would be a very minor aspect. Uh, but the way they play uh, this kind of uh, interaction be between the instruments which is uh, not uh, organized by the conductor. It's really between the, the players. This is something which uh, maybe has to do with my body <clears throat> experience that I had tried to, uh, to find ways in my chamber music, how this kind of interaction between the musician can take place. Just like that, not more. Okay, so, so it means you don't believe about the, the meaning of fusion in this case then? Yeah, but for me, this is not fusion, it's just, as I said, the transcultural aspect uh, to have kind of interaction between musicians is nothing special in Bali. It's, it's just very highly developed in Bali or in Java. And uh, in Western music, it's, you have it also in the string quartet, but not in a big orchestra or in a big ensemble, uh, because there it's normally a conductor who has to organize it. And that's the difference. Okay, uh, and uh, how about the if we see the development of the world, uh, uh, yeah, lately, yeah, everything is open, and then we could communicate like this, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, without any border. So uh, I, I don't know. This is what, uh, my, 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 what, what I'm thinking that everything is, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, we, 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 yeah, I think I believe, including uh, the, in the culture, everything is going to be. Uh, mixed together. So, so what do you think about that? No, I don't think so. And uh, I hope it's not because I would like to uh, focus on the differences, uh, on the differentiation between the, uh, the various things. It's correct would you say that we have the, at least the possibility to know about each other better than we had maybe 100 years ago. That's correct. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that everything becomes a melting pot in arts. I would, I would really try to, 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 to uh, work for the opposite, that uh, we know much about each other, but we also uh, focus on the differences between each other uh, and differentiate uh, things in, instead of bringing them together in a kind of superficial way. Okay, it means, uh, can, can I say it, 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 it seems like uh, Indonesian uh, motto, university in diversity. I would agree unity, with that. Unity in diversity, ben, yes, Tunggal, I would Ika, agree something with like that. that. I would okay. agree with that. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Mas you're, you're welcome. Okay, then let us go on to your latest composition, The Time After Reset. This is your third composition for Gamelan Orchestra. Mm -hmm. This piece for Javanese gamelan, percussion and fixed media mm -hmm. was supposed to be performed by the gamelan ensemble 
from Indonesia, Kiai Fatahila from Bandung during the new music festival now, which was planned to take place at the end of last year in Essen, right? Right. Unfortunately, the concert had to be cancelled due to the pandemic and the premiere of the piece was rescheduled to 2022. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it before, but you have only written three pieces for Gamelan Orchestra. Yeah. Why didn't you compose more often for Gamelan instruments? And why did you decide this time to write for Gamelan Orchestra again? Actually, all three pieces had been uh, written on demand. Uh, the first one was because of the cultural uh, collaboration project, project between Switzerland, Germany and Bali. Uh, the second one was a commission by the Evergreen Club Gamelan in Toronto. Uh, and as a matter of fact, after that second piece, uh, Cross Currents, I decided not to compose for Gamelan anymore. And uh, then two years ago, uh, this festival from Essen, they came and asked me whether uh, I could write a new composition for Gamelan. And my first reaction was no. <laughs> mm. But then out of various reasons, also private reasons, I thought, uh, okay, I, have, uh, I was at that time also in a very deep private crisis. Uh, I said to myself, okay, Gamelan has accompanied my life for the for more than 40 years. And why not get back to the to my re, to my roots in, in, the, in that case and try to make something completely different, uh, which uh, is not typical for Gamelan, but which I can only realize with Gamelan instruments. Mm. And uh, the time after. Now it's it's very funny because it, it can refer to the Corona crisis later. Uh, <laughs> for me, it was the time after because of a private situation and reset means starting again from mm. the very beginning, rethinking everything what I have done in in my own compositions, what I have done in my gamelan practice, in my cultural approach at all, and that finally then when I have thought about that, then I finally thought okay. I can do it once, one more again. Hmm. And uh, that led me now, uh, uh -huh, there's a question, why did you compose for Javanese Gamelan, not Balinese? Uh, I think this was uh, more a practical aspect. First, it was clear there is only hmm. one group uh, that could play that, which is Claire Fatahila in Bandung. They are the only group who could play such a complex score uh, and uh, they are not familiar, familiar with Balinese gamelan instruments, so I chose Javanese instruments, which they had, and uh, that was the reason. And I also found it very interesting to work with this duality of the two scales, Pelog and Slendro, which became a main issue of the piece. So that's the reason why I choose uh, Javanese gamelan. But why did you choose earlier not to compose for gamelan instruments again? Because I felt the, 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 this instrument, if you recall that what I spoke about, the transcultural and mm. the intracultural, gamelan instruments with their defined scales in, 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 in the bronze instruments, they are, they are so cultural imminent that I feel even playing two notes, you, you, you already feel uh, ah, that's Balinese, uh, Balinese or German, <laughs> Gamelan. Yeah? Yeah. I felt in a way limited as a composer to, to, to express my own music with these instruments, mm. uh, at least at that time. Yeah? And uh, so I needed this kind of, let's say, rethinking process for myself uh, to do it again. And I did it in a very special way, I think. And I'm very thankful to my two friends, uh, Ivan Gunawan, who did a fantastic work in, prepara in preparing uh, the piece and the tapes. Uh, there are some tapes which we play in, and also Max Riefer, the percussion player who joins as a percussion player. Mm. So what we have so far was is the final result after a two-week rehearsal in Bandung last year in February, just before the lockdowns everywhere. <laughs> And we still have this document, which uh, we have as a, I have as a YouTube video 
on my website. It's still a rehearsal. Uh, no, Barbara, uh, you can hear it now, uh, but not in the final version. I say that because the final <laughs> version will be on another Gamelan instrument set, the one from Martin Earhart, who is also there. Hello, Ma hi, Martin. Uh, so some sounds will be different. And the percussion instruments, which Max is playing in Bandung, were not so pleasing. So mm -hmm. we just find some imitations of that, what really should be there. So the real sound you can only hear then in 22, or the 1st of November in 2022 in Essen. But at least this uh, last rehearsal had convinced me so much that I put it as a video, the, it was filmed, I put it on my uh, YouTube channel. And I think that's, we don't listen to the music. I think, uh, uh, Birgit, we just go on to the to the video now. Yes. Would you, would you agree? Yes, I agree. Good. But could you, before we watch the, the video, could you tell us more about the creation of this piece? Were you in close contact with the musicians during the composition process? No. Or did, so they did, they got the complete notation after the composition was finished? Yes. Mm. And then you, we, we spoke only how I should notate it uh, for them. And uh, then uh, Iwan prepared it for that, for his musicians. I don't know how he did it uh, and I don't care. At least when I came to the first rehearsal, it was already very well prepared. Really? Huh? Two fantastic weeks in working. No, I went to this, to the Gamelan of Martin Earhart in Leverkusen. And uh, I made recordings of all the instruments and uh, measured the frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> that I knew which palette of pitches I had for that piece. And then uh, I had all, during the composing process, I had about 20 papers lying around me here on my desk where all the informations have been. And then I tried to put it together. That was more or less the way I worked with mm. that piece. Because the problem is, as you know, uh, every gamelan set has a slightly different tuning. Mm. So uh, fortunately, the one in Bandung and the one from Martin Earhart, it's not so different. So that was a good possibility. Uh, that's why also I choose the one from Martin. And uh, Martin has already uh, rented his instruments uh, to Kiai Fatahila when in 2005, when they played at the Gamelan Festival in Berlin. Mm. So they are also with there is a kind of family feeling between Martin, his instruments, and Kjai Fatahila. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, I think we should watch the video now, speaking of the time after reset. I have two more questions, but they are, they are not really uh, related to the time after reset, so I think it would be better to watch the video now, as we have just talked about the piece. Okay. I think we should also not uh, we should only look to a part. Yes. And if someone wants to, it's 25 minutes. And if someone wants to see it complete, or the, uh, just go on my YouTube channel, Dieter Mark, and then there it's the time after reset. I will also put the link into our chat later on. Okay. Um, so we watch it now, and you just uh, tell us if you want us to stop the video, okay? Yes. So Yadi, please go on with the time after reset. But the video, not the, not the sound. Yes.
Okay. So if someone wants to listen it uh, completely, it's, as I said, on my YouTube channel, uh, just my, put in my name and then the piece is called The Time After Reset. And uh, I think it's, it's helpful to listen to it with uh, good stereo equipment or with headphones because also very extreme dynamics from very soft to very loud. And uh, this is hardly uh, possible by a such an, uh, that's a laptop or something like that maybe. Yeah. Okay, you still have two, uh, you have two questions, uh, Birgit. But there is also a question from Aristario Nodita. Yeah, I already read that. Uh, and I think, dear Aris, uh, there is an, it's no intentional uh, reference to any gamelan, conventional gamelan practice. So if you find that in the piece, that's fine for me. Uh, but. Uh, that's up to everyone and I won't, I won't speak about it. But I have an additional question. Uh, yeah. Can I ask Max Riefer something, Dieter? Yeah, I'm sure you can. He was the percussionist, right? Yes. Uh, Max, how, was it the first time you, you played together with a gamelan orchestra? In, in this combination, yes. And it was very interesting because what Dieter said, they were they were so well prepared. I did not rehearse with them from the beginning. I came only after the first week, mm. and um, you know, I'm, I'm let me say I'm used to play Dieter's scores. You know, I've, I've played many pieces of his, and I prepared the score as I usually do. <laughs> and I went there, and I'm let me say I think I'm I'm quite capable of counting very complex rhythms. So I went there. And I played from the score and I was the one who was completely off. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Akwata Hila was beautifully together. They really played this piece really, it, came, it was so organically, it was really wonderful. And I was the one who had to struggle because I had to understand that playing together uh, in, in, well, in a gamelan ensemble anyway, but then also in this combination works completely different mm -hmm. or, or at least very different than what I'm used to when I play in mixed chamber ensembles. Mm. Um, I, I think in the end it worked quite well, but it was, I, I remember, <laughs> especially my first rehearsal, I felt very embarrassed when I walked out of there. I, I felt completely <laughs> unprepared, although I wasn't, but yeah, mm. I had to, I really had to adapt to this. Yeah, I find this very amazing when I watch this video, how, how compact this group um, and how connected they are with their instruments. I don't know if this is maybe it's a stupid comment Dieter but <laughs> no, I want to say that that's fine. <laughs> um, okay do we have any more comments or any questions to the time after reset before I come to my last two questions no no okay, okay. Dieter knowing yeah. you now a little bit I am afraid it would be too easy to reduce your compositional work on the influence of gamelan music only. We have also learned this today. Could you tell us also about other influences or other, I don't know, musical styles uh, that are important for you as a composer and how are those reflected in your work? How they are reflected in my work, I, 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 can't, I, I can't say because there are things which uh, uh, have been interesting for me for example, I learned a lot from medieval music from Guillaume de Machaut and the isorhythmic structures, uh, which had been important for me. I learned a lot from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart uh, regarding formal balance. If you work not in a developmental way, but with a kind of Lego, with, with uh, like, uh, it's, it's more an, ad an additive style of composition, and which is in a way similar in Bali, by the way. And uh, I learned maybe most regarding instrumentation, orchestration, and how to compose sound color from uh, Maurice Ravel, mm -hmm. which is uh, in, in many regards uh, my, my, my big idol in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Duke Ellington. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also a very fanta fantastic uh, orchestrator. And uh, now in, in, in recent times, it, it was, for example, the French spectralists and also Helmut Lachenmann in various ways 
more from the concept of, com of composing. And his concept is, as I said at the beginning, you have to compose your instrument. Don't try to go into the supermarket of music cultures <laughs> and take out uh, uh, what you find and put it together because you don't have any ideas for yourself. And I think this is the, the, the most important thing for me that I try always to, to get back to myself mm -hmm. and start from scratch to compose my instrument. Mm -hmm. Duke Ellington, that was the key word to my last question. Oh. We may not forget that you are also a composer of really thrilling jazz big band pieces and you must introduce us to this side of yours. What is it that makes you compose for big band? And <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to ask again, can we find any Balinese or West Javanese influences in your big band compositions? Yes, the first piece was called Sunda Jive because it's a pentatonic melody, uh, which I once did in 1990 uh, when the Baden-Württemberg Jazz Youth Orchestra came to Bandung and we made a project <coughs> at, <coughs> at that SDSE Bandung with some gamelan musicians and there the, the main melody of this Sunda Jive piece is uh, from that time and it was my first big band piece that I wrote again I think in 2013 after a long time I think the last one I wrote in the 1970s in, in my university times so it was after such a long time I started again big band and you know what the what the reason was Indonesia there is a very uh, good big band in Bandung called the Salamander. Yeah. Band, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a product, project with the Goethe Institute with, uh, uh, oh, with what's it called? Balden. Uh, I don't know the, 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 the pre name for it. It's, uh, anyway, he couldn't come. And then the Goethe Institute asked me whether I would like to jump in because the leader of the band, he knew me already. Mm -hmm. And then I started to, uh, to coach that big band. And I thought, hey, if I coach them, I could also uh, compose again uh, for, for, for big band. And that's, that's why I started again to write. The first piece was really Sunda Jive. And then I, I composed about five pieces for the group in, in, in Bandung. And uh, when I came back to Germany, I showed them to our big band leader at our university and said, hey, wow, hey, we make a project. And so it, got, it went on and I composed more pieces and we, we, we did two CDs now with our big band. Also, we have, don't have a jazz department, but we have a lot of enthusiastic students who would like to play that music. And I'm very happy that we could do that. And unfortunately now we cannot play anymore because of Corona but we still have these examples and it was such a fun for me to to get back to my roots to compose again for big bands in my quite individual style i could say uh, and not in the standard big band style and uh, yeah I, I, it's fun for me i know you have a piece you want to play for us right yeah, we can, if, if you want, we can do that as, yes. as, as, as our end of the session. It's called Outrageous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> um, I would, uh, there was an interesting and nice comment from Jody Diamond. Uh, it's already a little bit up. Uh, Jody, maybe you can say something about uh, influences in a composer's music. Maybe you can just switch on your microphone and your screen. Yeah, and I, I don't think you, I don't think you want my video on right now. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, I think that uh, looking for elements of what a composer has experienced musically in his music as separate musical elements doesn't not only doesn't make sense but it does a real disservice to the creative soul of a composer one would hope that when you listen to a music you it becomes part of your life experience and part of who you are i i worked for many many years with lou harrison i was his gamelan teacher and um arranger and what was interesting about Lou, and I think Dieter does this too, is when he wanted to be, quote, influenced, when he wanted to know a music, he didn't just listen to it. He would study it and play it and talk to musicians and build instruments so that by the time Lou was finished getting to know a music, it, it wasn't something, it was part of who he was. And I think Dieter has done the same thing, a lifelong commitment to being in Indonesia, hearing music, knowing it, so when he composes, it's the soul of his music is his soul. And all of his life experiences combine to create what that creative soul is going to be. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I'm, I just rem uh, uh, recall, uh, I think it's from Paul Drescher, a nice quote, he said, uh, about uh, Lou, when when all people started to use computers, Lou started how to make ink for writing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. I love that. <laughs> yeah, mm. how, to, how to make paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he loved hemp paper. He thought that was. A big I can, can imagine. Yeah, that you could make paper out of out of hemp. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I would. I what I would really hope for in our musical future is that. <clears throat> we stop using the words um, East and West. Thank you. you know, had particular meanings at one time. 
but I think we, we know each other so much better and there's such different kinds of interaction that um, I don't find those helpful, especially when East means music that we don't understand and West means music that we do understand. I, I would really like to find different words when we want to say East and West. Are we saying you know, here and there or you and me or I'd like to find new words to express what we mean by East mm -hmm. and West because it's an old dichotomy. And it's old, uh, May I ask a question regarding to that East Western thing according to so it's uh, are you listening? I, I, I'm hearable. Dieter? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's more question referring to the very first things you said. Um, Dieter and I we know it very well since years. Uh, listening to to what you've learned and the way you learned uh, gamelan music is not the way you learned Western music. So regarding to the idea of Eastern Western. Uh, how do you really uh, identify um, the the well the work the works you you know about? Um, oh, that's difficult in English. Uh, how do you say it in Indonesian? No, say it in German. Yeah, I, yeah, I say it in Indonesian. You know, also, uh, wie wie kannst du eigentlich diese indonesischen Werke? unterscheiden und, und, und wie unterscheidet sich das von dem, was ich gelernt bin, zu hören von äh, dem, was ich gelernt habe, ähm, was, was dieses Western Music quasi betrifft. Also, okay, she's, she's asking how, I, how can I distinguish uh, thank you. A, piece, thank you. a piece of Gamelan from another piece of Gamelan. And I said, it's, it's very easy. It's the same way how I can uh, distinguish between Beethoven's fifth and Beethoven's sixth symphony. It's just that you have to know the language uh, and the grammatics of that music, and then uh, you can do, then it's quite easy. If, if what you what is the grammatics? grammatics? If you don't know the grammatics, it, it's almost impossible. Then each string would have from Mozart sound the same uh, for a Balinese, and each Balinese composition sounds the same for a Westerner. It's just in the moment you don't know the language, the, the, the grammatics, you can have an emotional approach to a piece of music, which for me is fine and, and, and right. But if you really want to, to get more deeper into another type of music, or even today in contemporary music, as Jody said, uh, into the in, uh, individual uh, language of a piece, then you have to, to, learn, to, 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 learn, to learn that language. It's, so it's about learning language, as you mentioned yes, before. Right, right, exactly. It's only about language. Yeah, that's uh, that's my conviction. And just one sentence to Jody: uh, If you're looking for for new words, my my word is always finding your own personal culture. And uh, so in this case, I don't have to refer to anything else, just to the individual culture of an artist. And uh, I'm so far, I'm quite satisfied with that. That's all we, we, when, I, when, when I give my lectures on my music, as I often use the title, uh, on the search of one's own culture. And then you have all these east west dichotomies, or you belong to this direction, to, to this Aliran, you don't have anymore. And I think it's very satisfying. But on the other way around, I'm um, speaking Indonesian or whatever language, Asian language, doesn't mean I'm an expert in music, is it? No, you do. You, you, I mean, the musical language we are talking about. Not, not the language of the, the, if you know the language of the culture, it's also helpful. But mainly, I'm, I'm talking about the musical language. You know, the, if you don't know uh, a piece of Lachenmann, if you don't know the language of Helmut Lachenmann, uh, a piece like uh, the first string quartet sounds for you, someone is trying to tune the, the, uh, the violin or something like that. But if you know about the, the, the idea of his musical language, and his, then you, un you understand what it means. 
uh, if so far before that, you can only have an emotional uh, approach to a piece of music, which is fine for me. And uh, I always suggest people who come uh, to concerts, listen to my music, don't read the booklet before, just listen to it first, experience it uh, in his complete uh, overall character, and then you may read something, and then listen to it again if possible. Thank Hello. You. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, uh, I am as an ordinary um, listener. Uh, yeah. Usually I heard Gamelan as, as it is, not like your composition. And it's very interesting. I find you're talking about language and uh, I would like to know how you approach the gamelan player because I saw that you use notation, but mm -hmm. as far I know, mostly in, in, in Java, there are no notation for the player and how, how your, your language uh, talk to the players, something yeah, like that. And that's a good question, yeah. and uh, it's in a way easy to answer. I knew when I uh, wrote that piece, I knew there is only one group uh, in Indonesia, as far as I know, maybe now there are more, who can really uh, realize such a score while reading the notation, which is Kiai Fatahila in Bandung. And uh, I just asked them before how I should notate it for them, that, they can, that it's more easier for them to read. But uh, they had no problem in reading that score. They just had to practice it because it's quite complicated. And they uh, even uh, promised me that for the premiere, which then is in 2022, they will play it by heart without notation. So let's see then. Yeah? Uh, okay, but uh, uh, did they understand your language? Because it's very yeah. different from-, yeah, from they, Because they know me. <laughs> No, I mean uh, your composition, like how they get into it easily. Oh yes, I felt I felt so when I came to the first rehearsal. I had not the feeling that uh, this was unfamiliar for them. They were very eager to to do it in a very good way, and uh, I think they have gone into the into the language of the music by learning it. Mm, okay, thank you. The best is you ask Ivan Gunawan. He's the con he is the leader of the group. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Dieter, as as we still have only ten minutes left, more or less, mm -hmm. um, let me ask um, <clears throat> one final, very very final question to you. You are about to move back. It's a personal question. Mm -hmm. You are about to move back to Freiburg now after your retirement. What are the concrete projects for your near future? Oh God! <laughs> I don't. I still. I think I would be able to answer that question uh, if we don't have this Corona situation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this uh, pandemic situation really impedes any uh, decisions, any plans at the moment, which I have. Uh, we have a lot of ideas, uh, to, uh, for example, at uh, PGYIM, which is our partner, uni uh, our partner university in Bangkok with Anna Chaini Tibon. Uh, she's also here in the, in the group with us. And uh, we uh, have a project with Aethian Youth Ensemble since the last almost 10 years, I would say, and working with uh, local instruments uh, together with uh, young musicians from Musikfabrik, Studio Musikfabrik. Peter Wiel is also involved. And uh, I hope that I can continue this project and uh, be for a longer time uh, also in Bangkok to work with the people there. And I have also invitation, as I told at the beginning, uh, to teach composition at the Stuart uh, Step program at Upi Bandung. So, and I will compose. I have some some commissions. I don't think that I will have a boring time. 
just you can't really predict at the moment what will happen because of this pandemic. You know? mm -hmm. So when all this will take place, don't I don't know. I hope as quick as possible. <laughs> mm. Okay, it's such a pity that we have to stop here because I just had the feeling that the discussion was starting to warm up and we maybe we could have uh, discussed another hour with our guests. It was just getting really interesting, but um, we have to stop here because of our language classes and um, uh, our course attendants are waiting for us. So I have to say thank you for answering our questions, Dieter Mack. Thank you for being our guest today, for patiently answering all our questions and all the questions from the audience. Thank you for our audience for taking part so actively, at least towards the end. And also you, Birgit, I know you have been very nervous before. <laughs> Thank you, Dida, for everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have done a great work, and uh, I think it was a very nice atmosphere. And also thank you to the technician, I forgot the name, who has yeah, done a very good job. And uh, so I think it was quite a nice event. Thank you a lot. If you are interested in taking part in our upcoming events, please watch our social media channels, Instagram and Facebook, at the accounts I just placed in our chat. If you would like to get more detailed information about our program and also about all the books and CDs um, we were speaking about today, just um, write us an email. You can also register for our weekly newsletter in German language by writing an email to us. The House of Indonesian Culture or Rumah Budaya Indonesia Berlin is an institution of the Indonesian Embassy in Berlin and we will be happy to see you soon again, virtually or in reality, di ruang virtual atau di dunia nyata. Sampai jumpa lagi. And Yadi is going to start Sunda Jive again while we are throwing you manually out of the chat, out of the event, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>